Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing how to amp up your social media game with attending dermatologist and social media guru, Dr. Monib Shah. Learn how to harness the power of social media, dramatically increase your following, and work towards becoming an influencer. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with my friend, Dr. Munib Shah, about how to amp up your social media game. Should be a good one. Hey, Munib, how you doing, buddy? Hello, how's it going? Good, man. Thanks for joining. Of course. Can you hear me pretty well? Yeah, man. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Let me get adjusted here. Because you never know how high or low this thing is going to be when you hop on. Yeah, same here. It's usually a some adjustments going on. But listen, man, it's great to have you on. I'm going to do a brief introduction uh, yep. just while we have everyone log on here. But a uh, pleasure to talk with my friend and colleague, Dr. Muneeb Shah. He is a dermatologist and, as we'll see, a social media guru. Um, he's a nationally recognized dermatologist ha who has used social media to educate patients worldwide. Uh, he's been featured on, in the Wall Street Journal, Allure, Cosmopolitan, Vogue, Yahoo News, NBC News, on and on. Um, most impressive is that he has 17 million followers over TikTok, Instagram, and, and YouTube. So uh, as someone who definitely takes social media seriously, pleasure to talk to you today, man. What you've done with social media for from a business perspective is so unbelievable, and I kind of want to get into that. Um, Let's just start a little bit by talking about, for those people who don't understand, the power of social media and why you got involved in it. Yeah, to start out, first of all, thank you for having me on. You know, honored to be here for sure. And I, and I love this podcast that you're putting together. So honored to be among the people that you've invited for sure. Uh, the reason I started was it was really just a creative outlet for me uh, when, I, when it was during the pandemic. And I was in residency at the time that I started creating content. And it was actually my program director that told me, hey, listen, like you may be able to see 30 or 40 patients in clinic every day uh, and you'll have a big impact doing that for sure. But when I when you, we watch your TikTok videos or your Instagram videos or your YouTube videos and you get millions of views in a few hours, the impact of that is 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 enormous. Right. And so he's like, I don't want to downplay what you're doing in clinic here. But I think that you really should take social media seriously because you're able to reach people and make a huge difference to the field of dermatology. So I started taking it serious from that point forward and it's turned into a business in its own right, but I never expected it to be that way when I first started. I mean, which is incredible. I think many people, and that includes me, don't understand the evolution of social media, right? I think even just 10 years ago, it was for teenagers, chatting, wasn't a serious platform but explain how social media has evolved over the last decade to really become critical for any business yeah critical for any business critical for information I, I completely agree with that if you think about it right the way that people consume information is really where you need to be right so what I saw was this sort of dichotomy that was happening between there was a lot of misinformation on dermatology that was occurring on TikTok, right you know a lot of creators saying, hey, you know, rub lemon all over your face or something to solve your skin problems. And then and then the reaction to that from the medical community was like on, you know, uh, an article in Allure or an article on, in the Wall Street Journal saying, hey, all these people on TikTok are crazy, right? And it's like, well, you know, if you really want to counteract misinformation, you need to be doing it where the misinformation is happening because that those are the people you're trying to reach with the correct information. And it's the same thing with with like, you know, starting a business or, you know, running your practice, you know, people are not finding you in the back of a magazine nowadays, you know, they're finding you on social media, because even when I'm looking for a new barber in a town, you know, I type in the town that I'm in, and I type in barber, and I see what shows up, I see what work they do. And if I like them, and it looks like I can trust them, I go and I check them out. And so I think we need to be where the people are, and the people are on social media. And I think that's where doctors need to be as well. So take us through your daily social media routine. I mean, I can tell you that if you want to do social media right, it takes time. And so you obviously have multiple accounts. you got millions of followers. What do you post on a daily basis? Do you post on a daily basis? How do you plan your content? Yeah, I'm the worst person to ask this because planning is not 
not my thing, essentially. You know, I started doing this when I was in residency. So what happened was I would go to clinic at seven. I would get back from clinic at maybe six or seven at night. And then I would make content from like 7 p.m. to like 2 a.m. And then I spent Saturday and Sunday creating content. So this is not for somebody who, you know, wants a, a better life balance, essentially. But when I when I graduated, then I was able to have a little I was able to schedule social media into my life. And so now I actually dedicate days to focusing on social media, creating content, doing interviews, um, and then working on some of the side projects that developed outside of social media. So, you know, now I've, I've scheduled into my day. But, you know, the thing with social media is that 50% of my followers are in the United States. So you expect those people to be either in my time zone, Eastern Standard Time, or in Pacific Standard Time. But social media is global, right? So, you know, I could technically be answering questions from people coming from India around the clock, right? Because as soon as the US goes to sleep, other countries start waking up. And so you definitely have to figure out a way to turn it on and turn it off, especially when you're getting a lot of engagement. And so it's, it, 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 you need to schedule it like any other job where you're like, this is the time I'm going to work on it. And this is the time I'm not going to work on it. But it's not like a nine to five type of thing. Got you. I mean, would you say that based off your experience and kind of the exponential growth of social media for a new physician coming out in the field, whether it's dermatology, neurosurgery, do you think social media is the number one marketing tool? Number one marketing tool, yes and no. So, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. You know, in, in our office, you know, I, I, I uh, co-own a practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we get a lot of patients from social media. But the thing is that a lot of times on social media, your followers, like I said, are not in your direct geographic area. And so if you're trying to grow your business, you know, having a presence on social media, I look at it as like having a business card, right? You want to show what you do. You want to show what the vibe of your practice is. You want to show the quality of your work, your ethics, all that kind of stuff. It's your, it's your calling card, essentially. But, you know, you may not be able to capture people on social media in your immediate area. And so still some of the old marketing techniques work really well. <clears throat> This is sort of my experience here is we get a lot of patients from social media, but we also get a lot of patients from like the traditional marketing methods, like me showing up to primary care offices and saying, hey, listen, I'm a new dermatologist in town. You know, this is what I do in my office. These are the way that I communicate that information back to you after I see a patient. And then, you know, closing that loop there in your local community is still really important because when I did those marketing approaches when I first arrived in the market, it did better for me than even on social media and le at least immediately when I did that. And so I still think the old marketing approaches still work if you don't want to be on social media, but you, what you can do on social media, you can do at scale, right? You can't necessarily do that in a local market, but what I can do on social media can scale many, many times over because I can reach billions of people. Yeah, that's really well said. And I, I think that someone who's trying to get involved in social media may look and say, well, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's TikTok, right? So many options. How are these platforms different? And which one, in your opinion, is the best, if there is a best one? <laughs> this is such a good question. And I don't think a lot of people think about it. Um, you know, they, they either focus on one platform or they try to focus on all platforms and spread themselves thin. You know, all of the platforms are actually competing for our attention, right? Not not just people that create content, but people that consume content. And right now, you know, there's this essential war going on between the Snapchats of the world, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and they're all trying to get a little bit of piece of your time, right? And so right now, you know, TikTok is winning. Like, there's no question about that. More people, they're getting a bigger market share, more people spend time on that platform. And then your Facebook and Instagram, that's sort of dwindling to some extent. And YouTube has, has been pretty steady in my experience. Um, and this always is changing. So you have to be in flux to some extent. You have to you have to adapt. But right now, I would say, like, if we're talking about today, you know, what is it, uh, December 2nd, um, if I told you today, what do you need to be doing? I would say you need to be creating video, short form video on some platform. Now, it doesn't need to be TikTok. It doesn't need to be Instagram. It doesn't need to be YouTube. But you definitely need to be creating short form video because every platform is prioritizing short form video right now, which is like, you know, 15 to 30 second videos. And TikTok is, is the platform for that. So what I do is I make my videos on TikTok and then I repost them to Instagram and YouTube shorts right now. And so that's what I do. But I do think the platforms are completely different. So 
TikTok, I look at it like it's almost like Netflix. It's purely entertainment and you can sneak in some edu education and some advertising into that or not sneak it in, but you can pepper it in, but it needs to be done in a way that you understand that the consumer that's there is there to be entertained. So if you're gonna educate, you need to entertain and educate at the same time. It can't just be pure education. If you're gonna advertise, you need to also be advertising in a way that's entertaining. Now, when you go to Instagram, it's a little bit more educational. People are a little bit more into the nitty gritty. The captions are longer. You have the ability to link out on stories. And so these are a little bit more robust. Uh, maybe somebody who's into more science, you can get a little bit more science back on Instagram. And then when you get onto YouTube, people are searching for answers on YouTube. So if you think about the way that you use YouTube and I use YouTube, I don't know. I personally will type in like how to fix a toilet on YouTube, right? <laughs> so it's the same thing when I'm making content. You know, I'm thinking what are people searching for? And I'm making videos to answer common questions that are more evergreen. And so I think the platforms are totally different, but a lot of times short video is going to win on all of these platforms. So another question for someone who might be starting out so many options better to focus on one platform or spend less time on multiple platforms yeah actually this this answer comes from gary v um you know he, he said this um at some point but it basically you focus 80 percent of your time on the platform that's winning uh which right now i think is TikTok. And then the other 20% you spend on the other platforms. You should never fully invest in one platform because one, the algorithms are always changing. Two, what if TikTok gets deleted from the app store and like all you have is TikTok, right? So I think if you're trying to reach people and the way that I look at it, for me, like when I started, I didn't have a practice to wreck people to. I didn't have anything to sell anyone. So I was really just making content to educate people. And the reason why I actually spread onto Instagram and YouTube was because I, I knew that the people that were on TikTok weren't the same people that were on Instagram and weren't the same people on YouTube. And I knew that everyone wanted to know this information about their skin. And so I created content on all the platforms because I wanted to reach everybody. But for a business, I think you should adopt that same mentality that you should be on all the platforms to some extent. Now, I think if you're a practice, if you're a doctor, I think Instagram goes very far because I think it's the best for actually creating a community compared to all the other platforms. That's, that's well said, because I think people get torn between multiple platforms, and then you end up doing none of them well. I like your paradigm of kind of focusing on one, not so 100%, but have a best platform that has the highest quality material, and then kind of distribute that to the other platforms. Um, what is the best single way to increase your following, right? Everyone starts an account, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and everyone wants to increase their following. What would you say is the number one tip to people listening into this podcast? How do you increase your following? Yeah, this is, this is a good question. Um, I think that content is king. I think if you make, and this is going to sound like a cop out to some extent, but I genuinely believe this. If you make great content, it will resonate with people. And I think a lot of people focus on trying to hack the algorithms. They, they do things like, you know, they, they try to share their own posts a lot or they, they, they ask their friends to like it or comment on it. And the truth is, if you make content that is engaging to people, that is of interest to people, that answers their questions or somehow improves their life, this is specifically speaking from a professional standpoint because, you know, I, my content is not targeted at like, the you know 18 year olds who make like dancing TikToks, right? You know, I'm talking about specifically if you're somebody who's trying to grow your practice or you're a professional in some domain, you know, what I think you need to do is create valuable content for people. And if you make great content, people will follow and listen, right? Especially if you do it from a place of authority and you do it from a place where you're actually giving people science backed information. So I really think is like focus on the video and I'll tell you why this this works like if even if you think from a psychological standpoint of the platforms right they the only thing they care about is keeping people on the platform right like they, they, there's nothing else they care about right because they're there everyone thinks there's like some mis mischievous things going on behind the scenes they're they're trying to trap you or sell you or the truth is they run ads they make money through ads so Facebook makes their money through ads how can they run ads? Well, you have to be on the platform to run ads. So how do they, and they can't run an ad the whole time you're there. So they have to run it every maybe five minutes that you're on the platform. So what are they going to prioritize? They're going to prioritize videos or content that keep you on the platform longer. 
And what does that mean? That means that if you make great content that keeps people engaged, the platform is going to push that content out. Like you don't need to hack the algorithm. The algorithm is going to want you on the platform if you're making engaging content. So what I would say is focus on the quality of the content that you're putting out and that th that will lead to more followers and more engagement. And that's the type of engagement you want anyway. You don't want to just get a bunch of followers that aren't really going to be enjoying your content. Now talk about the importance of consistency. I've heard that obviously quality of content is paramount, but consistency on a daily basis or every other day or weekly basis, how important is it to be consistent in your posting? Yeah, this is, this is a good question. So um, one, I think that consistency is really important for, again, the platforms to start to prioritize your content, uh, especially on YouTube. I notice more than any other platform, the more you post, the more they push your content out. You know, you don't want to post like a hundred times a day, but at the same time on, on, on TikTok, I would say post one video a day, believe it or not, at least uh, on Instagram, I would say like three videos a week. And then uh, on TikTok, at least one video I mean, on YouTube, at least one video a week. So posting cadence is very important. Um, time of the day that you post, not as important, but the consistency at which you're putting content out, I think is important. Now let's talk about hashtags, account tags, reposts. How do you get the most bang for your buck? I mean, you could spend hours looking through hashtags. How do you personally recommend people get the most bang for their buck with those? So hashtag strategy um, is, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, everything I do, I do it with sort of reason. And when you look at Instagram, I think hashtags become more important because of the way that people, the way that the algorithm works is that it sort of uses those hashtags to figure out what your content is about and then try to push it to the correct audience. So you want to make the hashtags relevant to what you're talking about. So if I make a video about neurosurgery, you know, you want to hashtag neurosurgery, neurosurgeon, variations of those words. Now on the flip side, if you're trying to drag people into your office, like you want people to know, Hey, I'm Dr. Maneep Shah and I have a dermatology office in Charlotte. Then on your videos, you need to be hashtagging like, Charlotte, you know, Charlotte dermatologist, you know, uh, the county, you know, things like that, that are going to let people know, like, hey, when I'm searching for you, I want to make sure that I'm findable for people, right? So that's one strategy. Now, the another third layer strategy is, for example, if I want, you know, Red Bull to sponsor me, right, but Red Bull doesn't know that I exist. And I'm talk constantly on videos talking about Red Bull, right? The, what's going to end up happening is they're never going to find out you exist unless you hashtag Red Bull, right? So, because they search their own hashtags. So, for somebody who's trying to be discovered by brands, using the hashtag of the brand that you're trying to dis have them discover you is really important uh, for finding you. Now, on, on TikTok, hashtags are not as important unless specifically you're trying to seek out brand work because it's all based on watch time. And what about going viral, right? That's everyone's kind of goal. When you post something, a video, you want it to kind of catch on and go viral. What type of videos go viral? What, what type of content escalates to that level? Usually content that you don't overthink. Um, I find it's, it's the video that you made when, you know, you made it kind of thinking, oh, well, no one's going to like this. And you know, it comes off as unpolished to some extent, and those ones tend to go viral. You know, viral content is impossible to predict. But again, I think that if you make content that is truly engaging, that truly adds value to people, like, for example, if I tell you something that I discovered in dermatology that is truly groundbreaking to me and then groundbreaking to the audience, like, they're going to share that with their friends because they're going to feel like, hey, this is an important piece of content that, you know, I want you to learn about. So from an educational standpoint, if you make content that resonates with people, it's more likely to go viral. At the same time, the other thing you need to consider is that, you know, say that, for example, a really important fact comes in your video, but it's at, you know, second marker 25. Um, but leading up to that, you know, second marker 25 is a really boring video. It, you know, you're never, the person's never going to get to second 25 to get that information. So you need to think about, you know, structuring your videos in a way that drags people in, in the very beginning of the video, because that's the time where people are going to decide whether or not they're going to watch it. So, you know, the two tips is, you know, put valuable things in your videos. And the second tip is put it early in the video so that you don't lose the audience. 
Now, what about getting verified? I know that people talk about that blue check. It carries a lot of weight. What is the best way to get that blue check? Because it's not the number of followers. Um, is it the number of engagements? Is it uh, just give us some feedback as to how do you get that blue check? What's the best way to go about that? Yeah, so the the infamous blue check, you know, which has also gotten a lot of, you know, interest in the news lately over Twitter. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, there's some, a little bit of mystery to it. And then there's a little bit of science to it. So I talk a little bit about this, you know, I do I do like, a, I did this little cohort of, you know, 10, 10 professionals that, you know, approached me and I, I kind of taught a class to them. Uh, about this and we go into way more we went into way more details about like how to actually get verified but i one day woke up with the blue check mark on instagram but on tiktok i actually submitted a form and then on youtube they reached out to me so you know it's it's very different on each of the platforms but it's it's based on a few things one you know follower account plays a role to some extent but only because it gets the attention of the platforms. Now, because you'll see people with a thousand followers that are verified. And the reason why is because they have some type of connection at Instagram where you know, they are able to verify them or they're a musician or they're somebody who is likely to be imitated, right? So they give the blue check to people who are likely to be imitated and they want people to know, no, this is this person's real account. And why would someone be likely to be imitated is because there's some type of celebrity or they have some type of mentions outside of social media. So usually what they're looking for on all the platforms is mentions in the press. So if you are mentioned in NBC and Fox News and, you know, Fortune magazine, like you start to develop almost like a, a celebrity about you and they want people to know that this person is a real person and not a fake account. And so that's how you get verified. But on Instagram, you can actually apply for verification through the app. They won't say anything back to you. I think you send in your license um, and, and the form and they, they just kind of do their thing behind the scenes. I think they look into how often you're mentioned in the press and how likely you are to be imitated. On TikTok, I think they finally rolled out a process where you can apply through the app. You used to have to apply through an email and fill out a form. It's, it was different then. And then YouTube, um, I don't know the process other than the fact that they reach out to you and they verify you. Um, on YouTube. And so that's, that's generally the process, but there's, there's services that you can pay. There are press, there, there are press strategies that you can take where um, you can actually pay to get press in order to get verified. So there, there's a few strategies that you can use. I mean, the whole thing seems so nebulous. I mean, you've got millions upon millions of users and how are they screening? I mean, is it a computer? Is it a person? I mean, who knows what goes on, you know, behind the scenes? It's almost like the Wizard of Oz, you never see what goes on behind the scenes and all of a sudden there's a blue check. So um, let's talk a little bit about Elon Musk and Twitter. I know that it's just such a controversial topic. What are your current thoughts on on the Musk takeover and what he's done to Twitter? Yeah, you know, I, I think there, <laughs> there are some political <laughs> undertones here. So, you know, I, I don't wanna go too crazy with it, but you know, if it's true, you know, and, and I, you know, we kind of have to take at face value what's out there that, you know, we're trying to focus on free speech and, you know, clearing out bots and, you know, getting rid of spam and, you know, really trying to make it so that it's a place where people um, are able to really share their ideas in a free way and not a dangerous way, you know, then I'm, I'm all for it. Right. So I think the truth is that I don't believe that people, unless they're, you know, dangerous. And, and the problem is, who determines who's dangerous and who's not dangerous? And are those people dangerous that are determining who's dangerous and not dangerous? So I, I think it's a very difficult world in this, but, but I, I actually look at social media now as like, you know, they're private platforms, right? Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, you know, they're private platforms, right? So, you know, every, anyone can say, well, you know, like it's not necessary, it's not free speech to have access to these platforms, right? Like legally it's not, you know, whether, you, whether you're allowed to use the platforms or not is up to these companies. But I think in, in modern day, like what we're talking about here is, is about how, how powerful social media is. I think it is the way, it is essentially the way that we speak freely now, right? Like in, in 2022, the way that we speak freely is having access to social media. And, you know, the truth is that, you know, if you're limiting what people are able to say on these platforms, 
it is in some way impeding their ability to have free speech. And so I think that there's a delicate balance between the two. I'm just glad I'm not the one making the decisions on who gets to go and who gets to stay. But I, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. So I'm excited to see what he does with Twitter over the next year, if not um, for progress to the nation, but if just out of it's like the comedy that's been coming out of it all, all too. So I'd like to know your thoughts on it. I mean, I think I look, I love social media, just like you do. I do believe that the popularity of social media has a lot to do with what has radicalized politics. You've got people speaking out and they have a platform now, whereas they didn't have a platform 15 years ago. And I think while that's good, because that's freedom of speech, it's also radicalized politics a lot. And like you said, people who shouldn't be speaking out are, and it's sometimes dangerous because their views are untrue or they're, you know, conspiracy theorists or what have you, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> so, so yeah. um, uh, you know, what is an influencer and how does one achieve that status on social media? Yeah, I think influencer is a name that influencers don't necessarily like um, because, you know, we, it, it gives this idea that you're trying to sell somebody something or trying to influence their their way of living or their thoughts. And that's what anyone does who creates content to some extent, right? You, you know, even by having this conversation right now, you know, we are somehow influencing um, people in some capacity, right, to make decisions. And so I think anyone who creates content is technically an influencer. Um, I think that most people prefer the term content creator because we look at it as like a craft in some way. Um, but I think that, you know, for me, I always looked at it like I don't want to influence people. I want to educate them. So I, I, I used to have this in my bio, um, which was education over influence or education, not influence, because I, I truly believe that one day there should be a world where I'm no longer needed on social media because all the content is out there. And once you have all that content out there on education on the skin, how it works, what ingredients work, what ingredients don't work, how to use the scientific method to try to make decisions then people are able to make those decisions on their own and they won't need us anymore. And so um, for me, I try to look at myself as more like a content educator, um, but I think anyone, even you right now are an influencer in my mind. Well, that's good to hear. I, I would say, you know, wrapping it up just because I know you're super busy. What would you say are the top three tips for our listeners who are trying to amp up their social media games? Simple, just one, two, and three. If someone was just starting out or maybe they're just, low kind of voltage right now how do they ramp it up number one just start posting uh, i think the biggest thing is people don't post and they they get nervous about what people are going to think just start posting don't overthink it you'll you'll it, it becomes perfected in the process to so just start posting that's number one number two is be consistent and number three is find your voice like why are you here and what do you have to tell to the world and then just be consistent with that narrative, right? And I think if you do those three things and you're consistent over time, everyone that I've actually like coached behind the scenes on this has ended up being very successful on social media. So I think it's, it is a learned skill. It's not something that um, you have to be born with necessarily. That's awesome to hear. Listen, Monique, thanks so much for your time. You know, incredible interview. I think what you portray is what I learned over time is that social media, whether you like it or not, is here to stay. It's an incredible marketing tool and you may not like it, but you have to get on board because it's such a critical piece to any business, whether it's medicine, law, whatever. And so I think starting small, building up all the tips you gave us are huge. So thanks for your time and I hope you have a great weekend. You too. Thanks for having me on. Later, man. Talk to you later.